Observers from across the world gathered on the grounds of Mu Yang Sa Temple in Palolo Valley, Oahu, to imagine a global, non-killing society. University of Hawaii political scientist Dr. Glenn D. Page, author of A Global Non-Killing Political Science, gathered guests from over 40 countries for consultation of this great idea. Let me talk about history as a museum. But recorded history and traditional history is only a war museum. It talks about war heroes, warriors, killings, conflicts. But there is a peace museum also. There is a peace museum of history where you have the events of peace, where you have the heroes of peace. Among the heroes of peace, an outstanding figure is Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan. He is regarded as the greatest Pathan of Indo-Pakistan subcontinent. The Pathans are a people known for their heroism and barrierism. They are the people who live in Pakistan they, and they are in the neighboring Afghanistan. They are the people who are now suffering and from among them you have the Taliban also. Now describing the Pathans, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan's son, a philosopher, an educator, he talks about the Pathan and says, His violent nature, his strong body and tender heart make a very unstable combination for living but an ideal one for poetry. One day he goes out and never comes back. He has laughed his way into a bullet that was fired by another of his own blood. His wife inherits from him a moment of joy two sons and a lifetime of sorrow. She hangs up his rifle and sitar and for his sons she learns to hide her tears when she hears a love song in the evening. And when the son grows up, he must shoot. He has no alternative. Revenge and death, death and revenge, always and forever. The coward dies the boy's mother tells him, but his shrieks live long after. So the boy learns not to shriek. He is shown dozens of things dearer than life so that he will not mind either dying or killing. He is forbidden colorful clothes or exotic music, for they weaken the arm and soften the eye. He is taught to look at the hawk and forget the night angle. It is a perpetual surrender, an eternal giving up of man to man and to their wise police. So that is what the Pathan is. That is what the contemporary Pathan is. And from this tribe, from this group of people, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan emerges, born in 1890. He, he he propagates the philosophy of nonviolence among his own people and in the entire Indo in Indian uh, subcontinent. Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan belonged to a family which was involved in, poli in nonviolent political action. They, all, they often and almost always defied authorities. He is the person who stood up against the British. He was the person who, in the 1890s and early 19th, 20th century, visualized that education is a must. That was the time when the British uh, colonialists were not allowing the opening of schools. He was banished, he was sent into imprisonment several times during the British 
colonial role. But he, along with Mahatma Gandhi, uh, fought against colonialism and he fought against bad customs and traditions of his own people. He was the person who talks about universal love. He was the person who talks about religious harmony. He was a very pious Muslim saying prayers five times a day and he was a very very practicing Muslim. But at the same, same time he was not a hater of other religions. He was far ahead of his time. He used to recite from Gita. He, he, he would recite from Bible as Mahatma Gandhi used to do. He was the leader who, who established a people's uh, force, a non-violent force, and which is known as Khudai Khidmatgar. And he talks about religion and he says that God does not really need anything from anyone. If we want to serve God, we need to serve his people. And so uh, he, he, he made it obligatory upon the members of Khudai Khidmatgar to work for the welfare of the people, never to take up arms and fight against injustices. And the history is full of glorious heroism uh, of the Khudai Khidmatgar. They were provoked by the British. The British took military action against the protesters, demonstrators, but the demonstrators never took up arms and ultimately they prevailed over the, uh, over the brutal force uh, of the government. Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan was against the partition of India. He was, uh, he, he did not like the division of the country on religious and sectarian lines. But Pakistan came into existence, a new country came into existence, and the party uh, which was opposed by uh, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan comes to power. Now, Ghaffar Khan's role changes. He accepts Pakistan but he, he continues uh, his struggle against feudalism, against tribalism, against dictatorship, against uh, tyrannical rule of the, of the uh, rulers in Pakistan. He had uh, a long life. He, he, he lived for 98 years, but out of 98 years, more than 30 years of his life were spent in jails. He spent more times in jails in Pakistan than uh, during the British time. But he never, he continued to, to talk in favor of people's rights, he continued to, to talk in favor of democracy, he continued to talk in favor of religious harmony. How he, however, he was unable to revive the Khudai Khidmatgar force in Pakistan. He was unable to revive uh, a journal which he had uh, brought about for the education of his own people uh, in uh, in, in Pakistan days, he was opposed to the, to the military action in East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh. He was opposed to, to action uh, against Afghanistan. I am sure that Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan must be a very sad man today. Because his tribe, his people have taken, were forced to take up arms uh, during the Afghan crisis. He must be very unhappy in his grave in Jalalabad, uh, a, a, a town in Afghanistan, uh, away from, from Pakistani frontier. He must be very sad that uh, his people and his country has been uh, destroyed. But he, uh, he is there as a beacon of light. He is there as a leader, uh, giving the message that uh, Whatever the odds be, you need to stand up, you need to, to, to sacrifice, and you need to fight out. <coughs> Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan is a very, very, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a widely respected uh, leader in Pakistan, though he was kept away from the masses for, 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 for a large part of his life uh, in Pakistan, but uh, when he died, the, the entire population and the people, very large number, came out and, and uh, they were there and they are is still there. I think that in this world of killing, and, and I think that in the Muslim world perhaps there is more killing than in other worlds. And I think that the Muslims have killed 
more Muslims than the non-Muslims have killed Muslims. Uh, and we can calculate and count about the killings in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Nigeria, in, in other places. And the Muslim rulers have been uh, instrumental in, in the killing of the Muslims in the Muslim societies. We should not always play the same game. And uh, if, if these Muslim societies and the Western societies are taught about, uh, about uh, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, then uh, we think that it would be possible to build up a non-killing world. In this temple of Buddha, where there are so many Buddhas, I come here to talk about the Siddhartha of Pakistan, the Siddhartha of India, the Siddhartha of the world, Kafar Khan was the Gautama Buddha of the 20th century. Thank you very much. But I'm here now to talk specifically about Martin Luther King and the lessons that we learned from this great leader. And I started when I was uh, 19 years old there in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, the sit-in movement. And I had the privilege of knowing Martin Luther King. I met him for the first time when I was 19. And we developed a long, uh, close relationship. And uh, in fact, the relationship came to the point I actually worked for him uh, full-time as uh, the uh, national uh, director for his uh, program director for his uh, organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and also uh, had the opportunity to be appointed as national coordinator for the Poor People's Campaign, uh, Martin Luther King's last campaign. I was working for the American Friends Service Committee at the time, and I decided that I would uh, uh, think about moving a move. Martin Luther King called me. He said, he wanted you to come to Atlanta, Georgia. I said, well, that's a good idea, but, uh, you know, I need more information. But he told me this could be my last campaign to be going for broke. So I had no choice. I was going to go for broke, and I had to be with him. So uh, instead of going for broke, it was a very enriching experience. I will not take 15 minutes to tell you this. I don't have a paper to read for you. It's in the book. Uh, some of the ideas that we'll share later, we'll talk about the training, more specific. But that's really what I do. Train, I teach a course also at uh, the University of Rhode Island. First of all, Martin Luther King was more than a civil rights leader. So he was not simply a champion for the black people in the U.S. He was concerned about ushering in an idea that was universal and one that was encompassing. And he was so inspired uh, when he began to read Mahatma Gandhi uh, for a president there uh, at the Howard University, spoke at uh, Martin Luther King's campus when he was graduate school in near Philadelphia, uh, Chester, Pennsylvania. And when he heard about uh, Mahatma Gandhi, he went out and bought every book he could find about Gandhi. And that's when he started his journey towards uh, a nonviolent orientation. Being a Baptist preacher, his father was a Baptist preacher, his grandfather was a Baptist preacher, he had was already imbued with the concept of love and the uh, Ten Commandments and uh, all of the inspiration uh, from the scriptures since he was uh, a Baptist preacher. But this whole concept of nonviolence, how you can put love into action. He himself said he loved he learned the ethic of love from uh, Jesus of Nazareth, but he learned the strategy of putting love into action from Mahatma Gandhi. So he was a follower of Mahatma Gandhi. He was a philosopher because he was inducted posthumously in the American Association of Philosophical Association and uh, I was there to uh, introduce uh, the uh, idea as well. This is King. Uh, so each philosopher has a utopia, and it's very clear that Martin Luther King's utopia was the beloved community. That was his idea. He had a lot of his writings explaining about that, so I want that here. But I recommend that to you. Of course, he was assassinated when he was 39 years old, 
and the older I get, younger that scene. But he was prolific in his writings and his uh, movement. Martin Luther King did not choose to be the leader of the movement in Montgomery. They chose him. He was pressed into service. They said, we need you because you have the ideas and you have the uh, preparation and you can represent us. So leadership, in this case, it was chosen. He did not run for office and was elected. He did not seek to be the leader. He was thrust into leadership and he took it upon his uh, shoulders to do that. He was also eclectic in the sense that Martin Luther King drew from many different sources in order to formulate his philosophy and his ideas. He did not exclude philosophers simply because of many things they said that he disagreed with. An example would be uh, Hegel. Uh, Hegel uh, was a German philosopher uh, who said many things that Martin Luther King disagreed with, but he did not put his book aside and say, I don't agree with him, I don't want to hear anything he has to say. Too often, even people in the movement refuse to listen to uh, the lessons of their opponents. We, uh, and Martin Luther King encourage, must be uh, as aware and uh, as informative of the uh, ideas and thoughts of our opponents because we are able then to learn not only what people say, not only what people think, but the process for their thinking. And that's critical because once we can understand the pro process of thinking, then we can be able to see the connections. Some of us refuse to see the connection between what our opponents say and what they believe and what we believe. So it's search for common ground. So while Martin Luther King uh, was uh, Gandhian and Jesus of Nazareth and all those things, he taught Tolstoy, he also was Hegelian in his approach to search for truth. That is that you find truth when you also recognize the polarities and you bring those polarities together, thesis, antithesis, and then you form the synthesis. So you did not throw Hegel away simply because he disagreed with anything. He found something that he could agree with and something that was informative to him and something that was helpful. It's amazing how much we can learn from those who are opposed to us. And I extrapolate on that by saying we can learn a lot from the military in terms of strategy. We have different motivation, different foundation, most definitely different goals. But many things in terms of discipline can be uh, learned from those very uh, institutions that we oppose. But let's not throw out the institution simply because we think institutions are evil but we must be able to find the good. So it is with individuals. Martin Luther King believed that every person was capable of doing the greatest good as well as the greatest evil. But the person is not evil. It's their deeds. And the goal of nonviolence is that you bring the good out of others. And the way you do that is you recognize the things that are not so good in yourself you become more sympathetic toward those others. So the transformation has to start with the individual, as been said here many times. So the philosophy is not only for external application, but it's for internal transformation. Social, spiritual, economic, political, holistic. So then we are talking about a holistic approach to dealing with the problems. We must draw from every discipline. It must be transdisciplinary. It cannot be simply in one pigeonhole and view the world in a very narrow way and to say, well, I am a this, I am a that, I am a other, in terms of your profession. No, no, you're a human being. The whole complete human being with all of those qualities. So we must first of all liberate our minds from the way we think. One of the problems that uh, uh, Dr. Mimpage had for getting his book accepted 
because people say, oh, well, this doesn't apply to uh, political science. What are you talking about? <laughs> of course it does. But in a narrow way of thinking, all right, it did not uh, fit. But thank God he has uh, broken down the door. It's all there on the table, and people cannot avoid it. And that is the most significant contribution that the book has made. And Pedro could tell you, it's not me, you know. It's, it's the book, yes. But what is used book to open doors has been the crowbar into many cultures, many professions. That's the value, non-killing with the time. So, the thing that we must recognize is how do we get uh, the intransient uh, uh, forces to open up? And we must find all avenues to do that. The research is very important, and uh, as I say, the research must go into areas of all knowledge, and as our search for truth must not be limited. The movement uh, had to you had to had to grow in people. This is my final point I want to make. It is one thing for a person to choose to get involved in the movement. It's another thing to have the movement grow in persons. Because you see, you can also choose to get out. You choose to get in. But if the movement is already in you, you can't get out. You become a captive. You become arrested. Your conscious, okay, become arrested. You cannot rest. So there are no veterans in the nonviolent movement. We have veterans in many wars and that sort of thing in movements, and they have gatherings for the civil rights veterans, but not for the nonviolent veterans, because we continue to move because there's something in us, not allow us to stand still. Let's continue to give until we can give no more. And that's the important thing about what Martin Luther King uh, lesson was, that uh, we cannot rest until we achieve our goal in the beloved community. And the other point is that we know that it's possible to achieve the beloved community because the movement must pre-exist in those who are moving towards the movement. Martin Luther King said to me, uh, the last day uh, of his life in Memphis, Tennessee, the Rain Hotel, April 4th, I was in his room, we had just finished discussing uh, some details of the Poor People's Campaign, and I was to fly to Washington, D.C. In fact, I was in flight to Washington, D.C. from Memphis when he was assassinated. But these were the last words he said to me, he said, Bernard. What we must do now is to institutionalize and we must internationalize movement and nonviolence. And I can say that uh, Lynn Page has me to carry out Martin Luther King's dream by giving me these assignments to go into all the world. So I'm glad to be here, meet with all of the other people in that uh, family. Thank you. Uh, we are going to hear from uh, Mr. Aryun Christian Naran Aratne and uh, Dr. Arya Tarat. Come to the point. Uh, good morning, friends. Since I have a little PowerPoint presentation, I'll make my presentation from here. And um, I have a problem. All those speakers who spoke before me spoke of those who are not alive. They are no more. So you can say anything because the leaders are not there to confront you. Yeah. But in my case, I have a big problem. My leader is right here. <laughs> I think uh, he he's right behind there. <laughs> so I can't say all good things about him because he has a mischievous side of life as well. <laughs> and very unfortunately I can't 
talk to you about that part of his life. <laughs> so I rather, I, I'm, I'm sure by now you have been with him for two days, so you may have judged him, what he is, his qualities, all that. So I rather not talk about his leadership qualities. You better judge him. And instead which, I better talk of the enormous amount of work that we do back home in Sri Lanka, Saravo uh, there. So imagine sound of bombs and landmines not exploding. Imagine rockets not launched and machine guns laid aside. Imagine sound of silence. Imagine a society based on Buddhist principles of Metta, Karuna, Mudita and Upeka and Gandhian values of non-violence. And it is, it is definitely possible for all of us. That's what we believe back home in Sri Lanka at Sarvodaya. So I have an invitation to all of you beautiful people to visit the Sarvodaya moment of Sri Lanka, to witness a holistic approach to a non-violent and non-killing society. Look at this chart. Sarvodaya is based on moral, cultural, spiritual, social, economic and political infrastructure. We begin with awakening, personnel, move on to family awakening, village awakening, national awakening and finally global awakening. <coughs> Imagine 7,000 preschools. I'm talking of Sarvode Sri Lanka. 7,000 preschools over 5,000 children's groups, 186 telecenters to connect the village network, 100,000 youth police brigade Shanti Sena. Shanti Sena in Sri Lanka is very much active and looking after 1,200 kids in 11 centers, they are malnourished, destitute, desperate, disabled and also underage pregnant mothers and we have 12 development education centers and we have countries one and only disaster management institute and community based tsunami warning system I must say that even government of Sri Lanka does not have a disaster management institute and uh, we only the only civil service movement allowed to work in the war zone, that is, we, ha we have been caught in a war, 30-year-old civil war, between uh, two ethnic groups, Tamils and Sinhala government, for the last 30 years. And we, Sarvode is the only movement, only organization allowed to work in the North and East, both by the government and by the rebels. Um, and Working in those areas, we just don't go and do only relief work, but we have a comprehensive program called 5R program, relief, rehabilitation, reconstruction, reconciliation and reawakening. And in the East, we are looking after 20,000 refugees. And uh, it is possible, this non-killing, non-violent society is possible for all of us. With a leader putting the trust in the generation next. Basically, our leader retired 10 years ago and the young team, uh, rather we, lead the organization. And uh, it's, it's one man's dream. It's a 50-year-old dream and he's right here. And um, I'm going to tell you a story. Um, uh, we have a program called Village to Village, Heart to Heart. We have linked 1,000 villages in the south with 1,000 villages in the north and east. Say, my village, I get together with other villagers. I collect everything possible, the gifts, the books, the dry ration can think of. And we travel to our sister village in the north or east. We spend three nights with them, digging wells, cutting roads, uh, helping them to repair an old tank or a temple and thereby 
mind you we don't speak their language and they don't speak our language the only language we speak is the language of loving kindness so we live there for three days and we bridge we build bridges and then we come back two weeks later they come to our village and they stay with us and we do the same kind of work the beauty is that we in the south been bit more affluent than those living in the uh, more ravaged areas and we get together with whole lot of other village maybe 10 15 village and those villages come and help us build the road cut the um, cut a road or build a dam or whatever <clears throat> so thereby this is the non violent methodology that we use or rather our leader taught us to build bridges with these different ethnic communities and also i want to tell you about the story of shanti sena shanti sena youth brigade is very much active in building peace building efforts in sri lanka so we our shanti sena youth go to northern and eastern part of the country and they live there for three months sometimes and these people come here to our part of the country then these mothers and fathers and youth come from eastern part of the country where they think singhalis are only killers when they come to our houses sometimes they see photographs of soldiers see my brother for example if my brother is a soldier i have a picture of my brother in my house so these people no sooner they walk into our houses they get scared and they want to run away they start shivering and when we ask them why no no you have a soldier in your family why did you bring us here they might come and kill us then we say no that's our brother he got killed in the war and the ltte or the rebels killed him then they start crying sometimes our brother or our father also got killed by the sri lankan forces they say so what better so and mind you they live in our house what better way of building peace bridges between the these two disturbed communities and one last thing i um i want to show you a 4 minute uh, documentary uh, it's a program on meditation and we believe in transformation of consciousness in people in the peace building efforts so we have meditation programs right around the country i will not go into details the one last meditation program which we had last year on the 2nd of october on the gandhi's birthday we drew 850000 people this program you are going to watch is a meditation conduct in prison inside prisons with 4000 prisoners thank you very much thank you thank you very much very just fine
Thank you for the present speech. It was a short but uh, awakening spell of breath. Next, I'd like to invite Luis Xavier Otero, advisor on non-violence, and Dr. Yolanda Pinto de Garbilia, former first lady of Antioquia and Senator Republic of Colombia. Buenos días. I'm so happy to be here with you. I've been honored to be with all of you these days. I have been learning a lot. And I present to you the message from Governor Guillermo Gaviria. I'm not going to read the, the paper. You can read it, this is the memories. And I, in the paper, I just put uh, Guillermo's own words uh, during the march to Caicedo. I'm just going to tell you very briefly what happened there. Guillermo Gaviria was elected governor of Antioquia, and the first thing he thought is, what is my duty? What is a good government for? So he said, it's because it's for improving the quality of life of the poor ones. So he designed programs to work on nutrition, education, shelter, and health. But in addition to that, he said, we have to create a peace plan that has to be coherent, congruent with everything else we have been doing. And he put all his effort on that. He learned about the United Nations Declaration of the Decade of the Peace and, and Nonviolence for the Children of the World, and he began to study about that. And he knew I was working with that. So he invited me to be a member of his cabinet and he became so committed to nonviolence that he put many, many hours of his uh, everyday work learning and studying nonviolence. He came to the international conference in, in Kingston, Rhode Island, and then he went back to Medellin and he hired Dr. Lafayette and Captain Alfin to go to the two-day core seminar, training seminar, and uh, he was reading all the time. Uh, about three months after that, uh, Caicedo, a town like 120 kilometers from Medellin, uh, very poor people, uh, they uh, lived out of coffee, and their crops were being stolen by the, by the FARC. The uh, uh, FARC are the Armed Forces Revolutionary of Colombia. And uh, one day, the, the National Federation of Coffee Growers told the people of Caicedo, I cannot uh, keep buying the coffee to you there in Caicedo because uh, last year it cost us 500 million Colombian pesos. So what you have to do is put the coffee in Santa Fe, a town closer to Medellin, and I will pay you a little more because of the travel expenses. And uh, they called uh, Governor Gaviria, we need army to protect our coffee. And he said, we are talking about non-violence. I have no more army. Why don't you protect it? Let's go to apply non-violence. And the first time they did it, and the FARC were so surprised that the people were really willing to talk to them, to discuss that they allowed them to go. And that point things happened. The first is that the people of Caicedo thought that that was all of it. They were ready, and they said, we want to be the first nonviolent town in Antioquia, and we went there and we provide, provided some training. But the second thing is that the press show that event like a big defeat for the park. So the next time, they were not willing to allow the people to cross with the coffee, and they hit two priests, and they stole coffee. And somebody called Governor Gaviria, one journalist, and told him about the event. You know what happened in Caicedo, the, the, the park again stole the coffee, and they hit, and they beat uh, two priests, and, and he said, what do you think? What do you, are you going to do? And Governor Garia said, we are going to organize a reconciliation march to Caicedo. 
When we went to the cabinet meeting that evening, the Secretary of Government told Governor Gaviria, Governor Gaviria, first of all, I want to know, is that true that you are going to organize a march to Kaiser? And he said, yes. Why? Because it's too dangerous. You cannot go there. There was a big discussion, and there was a votation, and we lost the votation. 28 people against, and only eight in favor of the march. He decided that he was going to postpone the match, but at the end he said, because at the end it's my, my responsibility, I have to do what is right. I am going to think it over. He called me to my office and he asked me, and, what do you think about the march? And I was, I didn't know what to say. I said, what do you think? He told me, no. I want you to give me your honest opinion. And I told him, I haven't ever organized a march, but I'm going to tell you what theory says. In non-violence, we don't allow violence to be that. You already said that you are going to organize the march. We have to do it. We have to prepare well the march, and we have to take some risks, but we, I think we have to do it now. And he said, I, I agree, let's go. So he decided that we were going to march for five days from Medellin to Caicedo, and, uh, and, 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 and we did it. We were organizing the fifth International World Conference in Medellin, so Captain Alfin and I had to stay there, and Dr. Lafayette was marching with the government of Cavite all the time, and Luan was there. And uh, three things happened. First, Governor Gaviria was conscious that he could get killed, and he left a, a letter to the Antiochian people telling them, I'm doing this much not because I'm crazy, but because I am convinced. It's my duty to look for new ways to solve the problems and to help the poor people to overcome the terrible pain they are suffering. I cannot just stay in the safety of my office and make people suffer every day. Uh, during the march, we were told by the people of Caicedo that they were afraid that if we got there, the park was going to take the revenge against them the next day. So we decided that uh, we were going to send a message to the park. Governor Gaviria sent a letter and also a, a, a video, and we went back to Medellin and tried to make contact with the park, doing everything we could. And the next day, the final day, we knew that would be the dangerous one. Early in the morning, the chief of the park called Governor Gaviria, as we wanted, and they agreed that they were going to meet some, some place in, in the mark. Uh, we knew that it was going to be very dangerous, and Governor Gaviria told the people, open. Everybody that was in the march. Now it's a fact that the people of the far are going to beat us. If you think it's dangerous, you should go back. Four full buses full of people went back, but we still have like 80 buses full of people that wanted to walk. Mm. In the message to the FARC, Governor Gaviria says things like, we have a lot of com in common, we are also looking for social justice, and I'm doing my part. I even ask the army not to protect us, to perfect the peaceful spirit of this march. I'm doing everything I, I can, I'm so committed, that I'm willing to risk my life and all of those that are marching with me, and now it's is your turn. You have the next move. Mm. Then uh, they didn't play fair game and they kidnapped them. And during his captivity, he had the opportunity to send letters to Yolanda, his wife, and uh, to his father. In the letter, he says things like, Dear father, I know that I have caused a lot of pain to you, my mother, my my wife, my children. But you have to think, what is my responsibility if I am convinced that non-violence is the way? Do I just stay there playing safe? Or do I have to go whenever I have to go in a dangerous country as Colombia at that moment? He says things like, uh, we have to look for different alternatives. And even I'm here suffering such a great pain, I think that my original purpose was uh, 
um, I was able to obtain my, my original portfolio and even surpass my own expectations because many people are now talking about non-violence. And I think that is my duty to show them uh, by example because I am suffering the most terrible pain that many people in Colombia suffer, kidnapping. And just to end, I just want to show that his commitment, commitment was so great that he wrote a letter to Yolanda telling this. I have been eating only, only plantains for three weeks. And I am amazed of how good I feel. So that means that plantains are very nutritious. So please tell the people of the nutritious program in Antioquia to include plantains in the, in the, in the diet for the children. And we have been doing that. We used to have 160 children uh, per year that died uh, out of starvation. And now this year, less than five are going to die. So I think his leadership and his commitment were so great that he has inspired many, many people. We went, uh, because of his leadership and his example, we went to work with uh, eight different jails in the, in the state. And I'm just to give a good example of Bella Vista, the largest one in Colombia. It was built for 1,700 people and it falls over 5,000. There used to be several killings per week there. And after the training and Governor Gaviria example, we got five years without one single kill. And so far, 238 of those inmates used to be inmates and that we trained to teach the uh, other young people that we used to take to the jail so that those inmates told them about the why crime does not pay. Now 238 of them are out and of those 238 only one has broken the law again. And uh, the, the uh, Residents rate used to be about 50 percent. We have only one out of 238. So uh, I think that that will be it. I don't know if you have any questions, but uh, I strongly recommend you to read Governor Gaviria's words in the paper. Thank you very much.